Welcome. So uh, let's keep talking about fields. <clears throat> um, so uh, Monday, I was halfway through a proposition when I realized that it's wrong in the book. And I was very confident in what the book was saying until, <laughs> until I thought about it. Um, but before that, I want to, I want to talk about something else to help you in the homework. Uh, in the homework, I asked you to, to do some division in a field extension. And maybe I'll do an example of that. So, so you can figure out how to do the same thing in in the homework example. So, um, so here's a field extension of the rationals. Um, I'm taking this polynomial because I can tell just by looking at it that it's irreducible. Why is it irreducible? I guess you can use uh, isomorphism on that one. And then right, the, exactly. The prime is two. Yeah, uh, all right, you get a point. What was the name of that one again? Eisenstein. Eisenstein. I mean, okay. That's um, if all the non leading terms are divisible by at most p in the leading, or wait. Well, at least p. So two okay. divides, uh, so the coefficients are one, zero, two, two. Mm -hmm. uh, B, so two divides them all, but four does not divide the last one. So when you put okay. all of these together, um, it tells you that um, that is reducible. I mean, in real life, it's not like random polynomials, you're going to be so lucky that this works, but um, like in the homework, it works <clears throat> a lot of the times. So, um, okay, so this is a field. So uh, let's call this E. So this ideal is maximal. So E is indeed a field. So the thing is, um, the thing is we should be able to divide being a field. Um, so for example, we should be able to find the inverse of anything. anything that is not zero. Um, so for example, I can ask what is the inverse of x squared plus two? Um, and I mean, well, what it is, it, it's the inverse of x squared plus two really. Um, there might be no more to say, but uh, what I know is that anything in here can be written as a polynomial of degree of most two. So, right, so what problem am I trying to solve? 
I'm looking for a polynomial, which is one over X squared plus two. Um, or maybe, yeah, maybe let's call it alpha. So alpha is the class of X in, in E. So I want some sort of polynomial in alpha that is the inverse of alpha squared plus two. This is the same as saying, of course, that they multiply to one. So this is the equation that I'm trying to solve. And this is the same as saying that the polynomials are one uh, modulo the, the thing I'm taking the quotient by, by definition. So, um, I don't know if you've ever seen how to compute like the inverse of three modulo seven, um, but this is the exact same business. So um, when are two things congruent modulo some polynomial? They have the same remainder after division. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess one must have remainder one. So that means that the remainder of dividing the left hand side by x cubed plus two x plus one has to be one. Right, uh, so it's a point. Um, so, um, or what, another way to say it is that when you subtract them, it divides the difference because uh, when you subtract them, the remainder will be zero. <clears throat> Either way, uh, I have I have this identity divides. Um, So for some polynomial, this is what I have. And if I move things around, what I can, what I have is, is this Bruce identity. I have two polynomials and then two, they're multiplied by two unknown things. And I'm getting one, which, which is the GCD because one of them is irreducible. The degree three one is irreducible. It doesn't divide the other one. Um, so really this problem of finding the, in, the inverse is exactly the same as solving the other problem of finding the suicide identity. Uh, and we don't have to solve that problem. How do I solve that problem? Well, you find the, you solve for the GCD and then you use the Euclidean algorithm. Um, mm -hmm. Like once, once you have the GCD and then that'll give you a combination of. I can do the Euclidean algorithm without knowing the GCD in advance. Um, so so what's, how do I do the Euclidean algorithm? So at least the way I would do it is to, um, I guess, kind of find the GCD of like the two polynomials and then, um, I keep doing that until you get one. And then when you have one, which is the GCD, you keep like like uh, substituting in like the equations to build it back up. So you have the um, initial polynomials that you wanted to use. You said? 
you said find the GCD and keep doing that. I think you, I think that's not what you meant. No. So like you find the GCD and then once you have that, you, um, so like it'll be one and then you'll have like multiple equations on like how you got the GCD and then you can like build it back, like backwards, if that makes sense. Okay. You're, you're clearly talking about the correct thing, but you, you find the, the remainder of the division, right? And then you keep finding the remainder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, right, so um, divide one by the other. And then you will, and then replace one, the bigger one, what, replace the bigger one by the remainder. So, um, I could write the boxes and everything, but I think I can do this in my head. Um, when I multiply x squared plus two times two x, or can I, maybe I can, oh no, times x. I think I already worked it out also. If you multiply by um, um, negative x over two, <laughs> Uh, if you multiply x squared plus two by negative x over two, um, and then I think p of x by one, or maybe or one half, I think. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you can guess, that's great. Um, but I'm gonna do the example, you know, so you know what to do if you don't know how to guess. Right, and that's also just one example. Um, uh, the Bezos identity only ever give you like one particular solution to the um, algorithm, or is there somehow a way to, um, I guess, solve it to where you could not just get that one solution? So you will always get the same solution if you look for a polynomial of degree two, in this case, of degree almost two. You will only get one solution because, um, well, because we just because we're working over a field and there's only there's only one inverse in the field. Right. Okay. <clears throat> so the Bezus identity has tons of solutions, but it turns out only one of them has the smallest possible degree. Um, okay. So. So this is the, the quotient, this is the remainder. It's degree zero um, because uh, I set it up to make it easy for myself. So I wouldn't spend 20 minutes on this. Um, so from here, so I guess we're done in one step. Two is a linear combination of the polynomials I'm interested in. And for, for all I care about, really, I could just mod out by mod out by x cubed plus 2x plus 2, because that's what I'm going to do eventually anyway. So if I wanted to get 1, uh, well, clearly, what I need to do is divide by 1 half, uh, multiply by 1 half. So let me just write that thing again in the next slide. <clears throat> so once I reach this identity, um, modulo x cubed plus two x plus two, so let me just write that the class of X is alpha. I have that one is negative alpha over two times alpha squared plus two. So one over alpha squared plus two turns out to be negative alpha over two. I think you forgot the um, half on the- Oh yeah. The P of X. Or was Thank it you. Yeah. 
Uh, thank you. So, but the thing is, it doesn't matter what that second one is because I'm gonna I'm gonna go ignore it right away. So this becomes zero. So, um, in conclusion, if you want to divide in a field extension, you do the Euclidean algorithm. Um, All right. Uh, any questions? Yeah, I have a quick question. Yeah. So I can see that that like directly applies to three B from the yeah. homework. Yeah. Um, and three A would that be a similar way to solve it or? Three A is easier because if I remember what it is, there's no dividing, right? Yeah. Three A, I would just keep taking powers. Um, you know, every time you have a omega squared, so. So this is the problem we're talking about. Every time you have omega squared, you can replace that by omega plus one or negative omega minus one. It's the same thing in Z2. Um, so you can just, you know, just, just do it. Um, right yeah, here, one polynomial. There's only four possible answers because there's four elements here. It's either zero, one, omega, or omega squared. And I can tell you right now, it's not zero. <clears throat> you could do omega cube and then square that. That's the easiest way. I mean, yeah. Um, I mean, we wrote a multiplication table for that, so you can just go over there. Okay. Um, so where are we now? Um, oh yeah, that. So that theorem in the book that's um, that's wrong. Uh, theorem 21.9. I mean, it's wrong in a very mild way, which is why nobody noticed. But let me let me tell you what uh, it's supposed to say. So let E be an a field extension. and let alpha be something in the extension. And we're supposed to say that alpha is transcendental if and only if um, there is an isomorph from f of alpha to the field of rational functions. Um, and this is the part that the book is missing, um, which um, which is the identity on the constants. And it sends alpha to x. So um, 
I mean, so the there's two so there's two statements that are, I'm claiming are equivalent. Alpha is transcendental, and the other one is that these two fields are isomorphic in a specific way. In the book, they say if and only if, but the only proof the left to right direction. So, you know, the proof in the book is correct. Uh, the thing is, they forgot or they they ignored. Maybe they thought it was trivial to go from right to left. Um, but from right to left, the condition on the right is too weak. Um, it doesn't. It, it's it's false. Uh, so. All right. So let's prove this. I should email them, shouldn't I? I haven't done that. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's go with the, the direction that is not in the book. So say, so, so this is very obvious now. So we have an isomorphism like this. So phi of alpha is, is x. And phi of any constant is itself. So then um, I guess to prove to prove that you're transcendental, you gotta go by contradiction because um, you're trying to show that no polynomial exists. Um, where alpha, where alpha van the vanishes on alpha, uh, should suppose uh, that there is a polynomial. So suppose that alpha is not transcendental. Um, so by definition of not being transcendental, that means there is a polynomial where you where you vanish. So there is some polynomial over f and f of alpha is zero. So some expression like this is zero. So what do I do with the information I have? Um, I may be wrong, but I think I'm just going to go off what we did in the previous class. Um, you know that then under, well, it was something like uh, X plus the ideal for this um, is equal to X then as well, or under the, um, the quotient um field or like f of x mod um the polynomial i'm not sure which polynomial but, um again i'm spitballing i i it's going to take me a little one to, a little while to understand this um theorem okay what you're saying is going somewhere um but it's it's this is really easier than that. So, um, so you could say, if if this thing is zero, that means I can think of the quotient by this ideal, and that's gonna that's gonna lead me somewhere. But really, I have I have an equation that holds, and I have an isomorphism. What I can do is just apply the isomorphism um, to the, to both sides of the equation. So I'm gonna have that I'm gonna have some sort of equation that I get when I apply phi. And it's an it's a homomorphism, so 
uh, multiplications, all the applying fee and summing is the same as summing then applying fee and the same with the products. And now, since fee of constants are uh, uh, since phi on a constant is the same thing itself. All of these A's are just themselves. And phi of zero, well, that's just, that's always zero. And phi of alpha is X. So, um, so what I get is that this polynomial is zero, but now this is a polynomial in, I'm not evaluating this polynomial anymore. I'm just saying this is the zero polynomial. That is, I mean, that's literally what I wrote. So, Um, alpha is transcendental. So, I mean, really, the, the presence of this isomorphism is telling me that algebraically, there's no way of distinguishing alpha from x from a meaningless letter. So, for example, saying that pi is transcendental is saying that when you write polynomials in pi, they have no more algebraic properties than polynomials in a variable. This is one of those theorems that seems like the the just how quickly you worked it out. The proof seems so deceptively simple that I don't I feel like I don't quite <laughs> understand it. I mean, I guess I, the isomorphism just sends like alpha to x, but I'm not sure exactly like what is there an example for this isomorphism. Yeah, so um, yeah, I mean, some things in math, often you find things that are deceptively simple, like you see a three line proof and it's hiding deep ideas. This is, this is not, this, this is actually simple. Um, it's just, it's too simple, I think. Um, it's confusingly simple, uh, but for example, so, Pi is transcendental over um, over Q. So that means that Q adjoined pi is isomorphic to Q adjoined just the variable. Uh, so here, so X is X is just a letter. X means nothing. Pi is three fourteen whatever. Pi pi is a number, pi is a complex number. So these are not the same thing, but adding and multiplying them is exactly the same. So, um, so let's, let's look at why this is true. You have, um, so you can always go like this. So this works for any number. You take a polynomial and you evaluate it at pi. So the polynomial x plus one goes to the number pi plus one. The polynomial x cubed minus x goes, goes to the number pi cubed minus pi. Uh, and this is, this is a homomorphism. I guess I, uh, I, guess I, I never, I never said oh, what q and u implies. No, so just the fact that the your your map phi sends constants to constants means that um, the only way for you to get the zero polynomial on one side is if the co all the coefficients on the right side say maybe the constant term are zero and so you show that the only way to get some algebraic solution with that transcendental alpha or in this case pi is by just having pi and there's there's no polynomial that would 
give you zero unless all the terms are zero and your constant term is pi. And so then the number is transcendental because it's not algebraic. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So let me, let me just, since I'm here, let me finish this example. So this is a homomorphism, but actually it's an isomorphism. Um, so it's surjective basically by definition of the right-hand side. Because q adjoint pi just means whatever I can get with a polynomial in pi, but it's injective um, because nothing maps to zero. So if I have a polynomial that a pi gives me zero, that means that the polynomial is zero because pi is transcendental. Um, if you look at so okay, uh, and then. If you look at the fields of fractions, um, the fields of fractions are isomorphic as well. Uh, because if you have the same ring, you can have the same field of fractions. So, I mean, they're different, but they're, but from the point of view of algebra, they're exactly the same, even though one is numbers and the other is polynomials. Um, so, so what's special about pi here? Um, so what breaks down if I try to do this for a non-algebraic number? Well, I know this cuts directly to the answer, but maybe I'm missing a step. You can find one such polynomial f such that um, under the well, you wouldn't just get the zero polynomial to give you zero because, for example, like x squared minus two um, gives us exactly. that. Exactly. So this goes to zero, and this also goes to zero. So this map since two different things to zero, this is not injective. Oh yeah, since two, okay. So these are, I mean, I didn't prove that they're not isomorphic, but um, it's, I mean, we'll see soon enough, pretty soon to see. Um, I mean, the right-hand side is a field actually, and the left-hand side is not. Um, So, but the, the difference between a transcendental element and a non-transcendental one is that some polynomials go to zero if you evaluate at, a, at an algebraic element. <clears throat> okay, any more questions? Okay, so, um, so this is what I was proving. Uh, let me remind you. So, because I only proved half of it. So you have a field extension and I'm looking at something in there and I'm saying it's transcendental if and only if there's an isomorphism uh, between whatever I have in, in, in E with the field and alpha and just the field of rational functions. And the isomorphism really shouldn't be anything. You should send constants to themselves and alpha to X. So we showed that if this happens, then alpha is transcendental. And so I have to show that if alpha is transcendental, then these are isomorphic. Um, and that's what's done in the book and it's done correctly. So let's just, um, let's just do it. If alpha is transcend, Dental. I have this isomorphism. So um, I really, it's, it's really what I just did with the number pi. Take phi from polynomials 
to um, f of alpha where you evaluate. So phi is clearly a homomorphism. Adding polynomials and then evaluating is the same as evaluating and then adding. Um, and next, the important thing is that phi is injective. Um, so why is this injective? Because f of alpha equals, so if, um, if you have something in the kernel, this is the same as saying that it's, it goes to zero and the image of phi is evaluating at alpha. But I already know because alpha is transcendental that um, that there's no polynomials that evaluate to zero except for zero. So uh, f itself is zero. So the kernel is zero. <clears throat> Remember that to prove that something is injective, you want to show that the kernel is zero. You don't want to ever bother with um, showing that two different things map to different things. So um, V is injective and it's a homomorphism. Um, so now V is It's a homomorphism, it's injective, and this is a field. By definition, it's the smallest field containing F and alpha. So, phi, so this is something we've shown about fields of fractions. If you, if you map a domain to a field injectively, you can always extend to the field of fractions. Um, extends to the fraction field. And, and that's it. So we could, you know, go through the whole work, but the thing is we've already done this when we, when we showed way back uh, here. The, if you have an integral domain, you can, such as the polynomial ring, you can embed it in its field of fractions, which is in this case, the rational, uh, the field of rational functions. Uh, and it's unique in the sense that if you have any field containing the polynomial ring, there is a map, you see a unique map, um, given an isomorphism uh, with a subfield. So, in this case, um, we have our domain and it's, it, it, we have an injective map into a field. So the field of fractions is also gonna be inside of here. Um, so this we, we proved. And to see the other containment that f of alpha is contained in f of x um, is just basically by definition because f of alpha is the smallest field. containing alpha and f. <clears throat> Maybe I should say, 
with their image by phi. So in conclusion, this gives us the isomorphism between them, which is exactly what I did for pi um, and the rational numbers. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so if you have a transcendental number, basically a transcendental element in a field extension, basically there's nothing much to do with it because you always get the same field extension. Like the algebra doesn't tell you anything. Like the numbers e and pi are not the same, but from this point of view of just polynomials, they do behave exactly the same. So now let's see what um, algebraic elements do, which is much more interesting much more important. So, so we have a field extension. And so we have some element in the extension and say it's algebraic. So then there, um, so there is a unique uh, irreducible polynomial over F over F. such that uh, f of alpha is zero. <clears throat> it is also the smallest uh, degree polynomial such that f of alpha is zero. Um, and while we're at it, it's called the minimal polynomial. Because it's the smallest one. So do we have to specify all this because there, it's possible to have another polynomial of larger degree that's also irreducible. Definitely. So, you know what the minimal polynomial of root two is, right? Um, well, not one, two. But if I if I go now and multiply this by whatever I want, that's just going to be zero times something else. So there's a lot of polynomials that vanish at root two, but there's only one. There's only one best one, which is x squared minus two. Oh, the left side is okay. Yeah, I think. Um, oh, I should say I should say monic. Because if you don't say monic, you could always multiply by a number. <clears throat> so, yeah, there's there's always a, there's always infinitely many because you can always do this silly thing where if I already have zero, multiply by multiply anything by zero. And and that's where the that's the idea of the proof. I mean, I'm looking at a set of polynomials where multiplying uh, gives you in the set. Um, so the key of everything is that the set of polynomials such that f of alpha is zero. is an ideal of the polynomial ring. So you add two of these polynomials, you get, oh, um, you, you get another one of these polynomials, you multiply any polynomial where alpha vanishes. Um, oh no, it's synced up. You multiply any polynomial where alpha vanishes by, anything else and you get zero times something which gives you zero. But uh, 
I mean, you could just, so it's an ideal, meaning you can check the properties of an ideal, but the, the book does it in a, in a smarter way. Um, it is the kernel of the evaluation homomorphism. From f of x to e, you send a polynomial to f of alpha. Uh, so we know that evaluating is a homomorphism. We use this every day. Um, but, and the thing is, the kernel of a homomorphism is automatically uh, an ideal. That's not something we have to prove. That's something we already know. And what does it mean for a polynomial for f of x to go to zero? Um, it means it means that f of alpha is zero, which is exactly what I'm saying. So um, now that I have an ideal, what am I supposed to use to show that there is just one irreducible polynomial there? I have an ideal in the polynomial ring. What was the question again? <laughs> it's just what do I do next to show there, that there is just one irreducible element in there. Given that I also know that it's the smallest degree element in there. You show that the kernel um, is alpha under this homomorphism? Well, the kernel is some but, set of polynomials. Um, but, alpha is not a polynomial. Alpha yeah. is kind of a number. So what I do is, this is an ideal. Um, so let's just call it I. What I know is that every ideal in the polynomial ring is principal. So I is um, I is is generated by something. So um, So f of x, so this f is the minimal polynomial. So um, well, I guess I'll have to finish, talk about this a little more on Friday, but um, it's gonna be reducible because E is a field because I mean, if you think, if you, th so, okay, first of all, it's going to be the smallest degree polynomial because it's the generator of the ideal. Everything else is, is multiple, so it has to be bigger degree. And it's irreducible because if we factored, alpha would have to be a root of one of the factors, and that would give me a smaller degree polynomial. So I'll just write that out on Friday. All right, um, so that's it. Um, remember that we have an exam in a week and homework on Friday. And have a good rest of your week.